and my brothers. Today I have the privilege of speaking to you about my priest hero who is Archbishop Emeritus Roger Schweitz. In order to do that I want to tell probably one of my favorite stories of him um, and that was the first time I met him. And In order for this story to make sense I kind of have to give you some background information on my life. So imagine 17 year old Jake just hearing his call to the priesthood after only really being involved in the Catholic Church about three months. So he's super nervous. He's got no idea what's going on. He's never talked to a priest before in his life. And he walks up to his pastor and says, hey, Father, I want to be a priest. What do I do? And, the <laughs> and my pastor says, there's going to be this, uh, this pizza party, vocation dinner thing in a week. You should come to that. I'm like, great, I'll be there. So I show up in Anchorage to this pizza party, um, pretty much like I do for anything, especially if it's a pizza party, in basketball shorts and a t-shirt and my letterman jacket. <laughs> and, uh, and I opened the door and it was one of those kind of moments when like the music stops and everyone looks at you because everyone was in a suit and tie except for me and I was like, dang it, dang it. And so my only method of contact to anyone in the room is the one pastor that I'd said six words to previously to that night. So I walk in and he introduced me to about eight priests and in Alaska seeing eight priests together in one spot is pretty monumental and I'd never been confronted with that many callers in my life so I was completely overwhelmed and just shaking hands like hi I'm Jake, I'm Jake, I'm Jake and just had no idea who anyone was except there was this one guy significantly older than all the other priests who had this enormous chain and cross and huge ring. I had no idea what that was about and so I go to get a drink and uh, uh, he comes and taps on my shoulder and says, hey, Jake, I want you to sit by me tonight. I'm like, okay, sure, I guess. Um, as I was in my mind, like, how am I going to leave this party without being a jerk, you know? So I'm thinking, like, <laughs> I, have a, I actually have basketball practice that I forgot about and I have to go or something like that. Um, so he tells me he wants to sit with me and uh, talk to me during dinner. Uh, and my pastor comes up and says, hey, Jake, do you know who that was? And I'm like, um, a priest? And he's like, that's the archbishop. I'm like, so your boss. And he's like, sure, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and so during dinner, I don't know, it's like a big table, right? And there's probably like 30 people there, all the priests and a couple other high school kids. Uh, and myself and the archbishop had sat in the corner. And it, he pretty much kind of turned his chair like this and was just locked on me the whole night. And we had about a two and a half hour conversation like we were old friends. And it was wonderful. He genuinely cared about me, genuinely wanted to know what my discernment was like, what my relationship with the Lord was like, and it was probably one of the best conversations I've had, and we had many like that afterwards. Uh, before I left, he asked me for my number, and I didn't know why, um, but by the time I had gotten home, he had sent me a text saying, hey, Jake, thank you for coming. I really appreciated your conversation. Can't wait to get to know, uh, to know you further. Um, the next uh, year of my discernment uh, was sparse with text messages and calls from the Archbishop about once a week where he would check in on my discernment and wonder how I was doing and giving me advice and things like that. Um, and I didn't know how rare this was. I didn't know that Archbishops didn't do that until I came to seminary. <laughs> uh, and I would get off the phone and guys would say, who is that? I'm like, oh, it's my Archbishop. And they're like, you're Archbishop? You just talked to the Archbishop? I'm like, yeah, I talk with him probably about once a week. And they were floored by that. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. So, extremely pastoral heart, extremely loving man who reaches in and engages the person where they're at. He's a real fisher of men and a real example for me in my priesthood. I kind of want to touch on four things that he's really done that I just love and I want to share with my brothers here and kind of give them encouragement. One, he is so funny and so free and he is so childlike even at 78 that it blows my mind. He can act kind of like an eight-year-old and it's wonderful. Um, when he learned that my love language, my chiefest of love languages is teasing and picking fun at guys, uh, he really, really took it to another level with me and uh, <laughs> he, he takes every opportunity to embarrass me and to, uh, to kind of burn me even during mass. Um, and an, ex <laughs> an example of that was um, I think two years ago I was serving Mass with him. He's also the pastor of my parish, so I get to be with him pretty much every day in the summer. Uh, and I was serving Mass with him in the Feast of St. Rose Lima, and she had disfigured her face because she was so beautiful with acid. 
Um, and as I was washing his hands, uh, he said, good thing you don't have to worry about disfiguring your face, Jake. And just <laughs> went back. And I was, <laughs> ah! I was laughing the rest of the mass and could not focus. It was great. And just things like that all the time. He loves, loves to embarrass me in front of mass. So at the end of mass, he has a competition with himself to see how uh, red he can make my face by giving an exhortation of how great of a seminarian I am and just loves, just, and we have Jake and just like will turn and smile at me and just, just let everyone know who I am and it just embarrasses the heck out of me and he just loves it, loves doing that. The second, uh, he's really a patient man and understands that conversion, as Father Becker was talking about, doesn't happen all at once. Conversion is a journey in our lives. Uh, he always is saying, Jake, you're only 20, relax. You've got a long ways to go. You're not going to be perfect by ordination, and you're certainly not going to be perfect by death, and things like that. Just con continually letting me know that I'm going to be a sinner my whole life, and there's no deadline of when I need to be perfect. Um, and just letting, helping me unite that to the Father and walk with Christ through that. Uh, the third is he will do anything, anywhere, anytime for the salvation of souls. Whether it's talking to random people on the street in French that are tourists, I've seen that happen. Whether it's uh, when I call him at midnight and need to talk right now, he's willing to meet me anywhere, whether he'll come to my house or I'll go to his house to talk with me. Uh, he is just an incredible man who will do anything for the salvation of my own soul personally, and I've felt that, and for my family and my friends. Example of my own soul is I was waiting in line for confession once, and he kind of walks by his office and sees me and comes gets me, and he's like, I need help. And he's like, why are you waiting in line? I'm like, uh, to go to confession? I'll hear your confession. And I'm like, uh, what about that whole external, internal formation? Like, you're my bishop, I can't really do that. He's like, um, I'm your bishop, I can do that. Let me hear your confession. <laughs> and uh, it was just, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, um, and the third and final thing, uh, probably one of the, the bits of information he gave me that I've chewed on the longest and really taken to heart um, is he says that God is going to do more through your weaknesses and faults than he will through your gifts. No matter how great your gifts are, he's going to use your faults and weaknesses more. He says things like, Peter was a great leader. But Peter also screwed up more than anyone else in the Bible. And God used his example of his, his weakness, put those directly in the gospel, to, to show us who are weak how to turn to the Lord, to show us to turn back to the Lord. Um, and he tells me that any time you're embarrassed, any time that you humiliate yourself, any time that you screw up, the Lord's going to use that more than any great homily, any great confession, anything like that. The Lord is going to use your screw-ups more than your gifts. So as my absolute pleasure to edify my fishing buddy, my hiking buddy, my road trip buddy, my confessor, my spiritual director, and most of all, my priest hero. Praise be Jesus Christ. Amen.